Hey, my name's Bruce Snell with BSG International, and today's class we're going to look at what we call class number eight, the one-hour employee-based skills, and we call this the foundation of awareness. As we're moving through the organization with these base skills and these base skills training of people and process, right now what we want to do is kind of focus on us as individuals because the little better we understand why things are happening to us, we can identify those things and be a little more compassionate uh, for our coworkers. If you look at, I kind of want to give us a little overview kind of where we're at right now uh, in the ABS certificate program. If you look at for this part two, remember part one we kind of covered the four barriers to quality and the change. Now in part two we were looking at the structured base which is the infrastructure, understanding the the concepts and defining the organizational structure and the team structure. Uh, we just completed our base work center concept. Now remember the base work center concept was very important because that's really where a ton of all this work is going to be uh, done both uh, people and process because this is how we're going to do and tie the, all these things together internally. Today's class, the personal uh, personnel based skills, the foundation of awareness, is kind of now as we transition out of part one into part three, which is the systems base, where we're going to really start formalizing these systems and all these things that we've talked about uh, here today. So today's class, we're looking at the personal skills, what we call our base skills and the awareness, because we feel, again, it's very important to understand and get a handle on why these things are happening to us. Okay, if you'll look in your handout, I'd like for you to turn to page one, and page one is that is the foundation of awareness. And we're gonna get into this, and I know a lot of these issues might not apply to you, but if nothing else, we probably have one of those skeletons in the closet uh, when we're growing up that might apply to them. So whatever you're learning, if you don't learn know any, if you know it all and you don't have any issues and problems are, uh, chances are you can help somebody else with their problems. Okay, so let's look at this. It's the executive summary, page one. Uh, base skills are required and necessary for the organization's performance and stability of people and processes. What we're saying there is that in order, and you've heard us repeat it throughout this whole thing, is that we have to have these base skills internally of both people and process for the organizations to stabilize the organization of whether it's, it's growing or it's changes or whatever. The demands of uh, change are as, are as influenced by our customers, suppliers, competition of our products and service that we provide to the marketplace. And what we're saying here, the demands of change, we look at all these things that are happening. The change are really not only internally what's happening with our people and with our organization, not only the things that we're creating in here, but are influenced heavily outside by basically our suppliers, our customers, and our competition of our product and service, that thing that we provide to the marketplace. So if you look at it, not only are we dealing with the issues internally, but we're dealing with external issues here. That again is why we need to develop those base skills. The base skills along with the awareness of the four barriers to quality helps bring order and organization with systems involved in inventing, I'm sorry, involved in invention, retention, and prevention skills needed by all organizations. The base skills again are looking at the people, the process, and everything that we're learning and talking about we have to always keep in the back of our mind are at the forefront of our mind the four barriers to quality and how they're interacting daily with us. And for the invention is that if we're uh, uh, turned on, tuned in, if nothing else, uh, is that that's where the creativity internally within the organization comes to be able to basically take whatever those changes and growth demands that there are and the retention of being able to keep what we do have and keep moving forward and the prevention skills, meaning that if we're going through this and building all this structure, we want to be able to have the awareness and understanding to look ahead and be preventive. Remember, we've talked so much about when the four barriers about shutting down the organization that we become a reactive. And what we're saying here is that we really want to get it and geared and be proactive internally within the organization of both people and process skills. 
And if you look at uh, some of the findings of the, uh, of the Bay skills, and the, the Bay skills are, we had an, it was really kind of interesting. We went into this thing kind of thinking that, in a sense, that we had, uh, that our people had these basic understandings. And we heard that stuff is that, uh, okay, that's common sense, that's this, that's that. Well, what we've discovered is that that's not necessarily what we're talking about. The base skills are required and necessary for the organization's performance and stability of people in process. And we're saying the demands of change are influenced by our customer, suppliers, competition of our product and service that we provide to the marketplace. The findings are, it says, the base skills along with the awareness of the four barriers to quality help bring order and organization with systems involving the invention, retention, prevention skills needed by our organization. When we're looking at our findings, the writing of the base skills, one hour, one page workshops, resulted out of experience gained over the last de decade and thousands of interactions with our people through the development of the base work systems 2000. So if you look at where did this base skill stuff come from, the base skills came from actual practice under actual working conditions with our interaction with our people, the interactions with the four barriers to quality, and trying to put some kind of a curriculum in place to resolve that. The only way that we're going to do that is create, again, awareness of people and process through these base skills. And so as I said earlier, some of these findings were, is that the wrong assumption that our that the personnel have base skills. See, as I, as I got into this, we were talking about some things that I had learned, and not only in the workplace, but had learned in school and stuff that I thought were really kind of, I hate to say common sense anymore, because we assume all this stuff is common sense. And it might be common sense to us, but to a lot of our people, it's not. So my assumption was, is that I assumed, I assumed a lot of our people had base skills dealing with interpersonal and communication skills. All the way from process, problem solving, understanding of why these events and actions are happening to us. The knowledge that most of our personnel learning stops after high school. If you look at it, most of us don't go to college and really the majority of us, our learning does stop after high school. Because what happens, we end up getting out of the house, we get a job, we either get married or we move in with some guys, we get a job, and then all of a sudden we're getting into a kind of a set format. And, that, and we'll talk a little more about that in a workshop. But what happens is, is that our opportunity for awareness and understanding is literally getting choked out of us because of the environment. We're either at home and we're at work. So what happens if we're not getting the awareness and understanding and the base skills training at work or at home, we don't have any other opportunities uh, to, to get that. And they're saying, well, we got to take some classes at night. Well, we're all trying to do that. And working uh, 40, 50, 55 hours a week, it's really hard to do that. So we're saying here is that for the majority of our employees, when you're looking across the table, look at them and the fact that their last probably awareness or growth came after high school. Now that's an interesting thought. The lack of base skills masks many of the personal problems. What we saw was is that a lot of these issues as we started kind of flushing up in the organization, uh, we were trying to figure out and write and define the curriculum to hold them accountable. And then we started moving through that, we started really seeing not only the dysfunction of the person, but the dysfunction it was causing on the organization. So all this the functional stuff that we're having, we're bringing to the workplace. So what we're saying there is that the base skills, and we're saying a lot of the problems that we're having in the organization, with, well, even with key employees, have to do with their base skills or their lack of understanding or awareness. So a lot of the problems that we face in the organization are really having to do with personal issues. Personal issues that we'll talk about here in a bit that have nothing to do with the organization, have nothing to do with the coworker. And you remember we talked about most of the time the deal we're talking about has nothing to do with the deal that's on the table. These are those personal issues and these base skill issues. 
We're saying as we go through and start uncovering all this stuff that we can't blame, we must train. It's not our people's fault. If we want to really get into that blame plain thing, then we're not going to accomplish anything. So if, again, we talked about those base characteristics and stuff, is that let's forgive, forget, move on, and forge ahead and look at that we can't blame our people. We must train our people, and if it's not defined, they haven't had training on it, then how in the world can we hold them accountable? And we can't blame or throw back at them. Well, if you want to improve, you got to go out there and you got, very few people can do that. We have to give it the direction just like we have to give the direction to our organization. So that's where we're talking about growing and helping our people with these base skills. It says 99% of the, uh, the personnel are good people and want to do a, go uh, do a good job. And guys, that, that's, that's exactly right. Statistically, that is proven. In every organization we've gone to, I don't even know if that 1% is getting up in the morning saying they're just going to go throw a wrench in whatever's happening at work. But the majority of us, 99% of us, are good people and really want to do the right thing. And it's really those four barriers to quality and the base skills that keep us from doing that or interacting. We're all trying to do, 99% of us are trying to do what's right. The 1% bad employee has less of base skills and greater insecurities. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing there in itself. We're talking about the 1%. Remember, the 1% basically affects 5% that affect 20% because uh, we're, we're influenced because that 1% is a great manipulator. They're a great manipulator of informal people or informal processes and that basically is how they manipulate our people. So literally the more insecure a person is, the more these insecurities come out and they're masked by all these other things other than the fact that they're they're lacking skills internally, and these insecurities start as early as childhood. So as we grow and move on in life, and we're looking at education in school, that if whatever we don't get there at home or in school from that time we're 18, chances are our growth isn't going to be much further. So, and that's the sad thing because we feel that the growth of both people and process, I'm just going to call it that simply, needs to continue throughout our whole life. Patience and long-term commitment to training and education. As an organization, we have the responsibility not only to our organization but to our people and to ourselves to continually improve and have long-term commitment to that. Because we talked about it before, hey, when do we stop training? Well, what we're saying is you don't stop training. Training and education is to continue from here on out. Uh, management, non-management, personnel need training and education and the base work center definition. Again, I told you some of the struggles we were having early on is the fact with these base skills. We had, we had people saying, oh, base skills, that means the folks that are down in the organization, they need these base skills. We're saying no, the entire organization needs these base skills and both management and non-management need these base skills and edu uh, education and the definition of their base work center. Because again, how are we going to manage, plan, and uh, schedule and monitor the organization. Management never had a system to train and or change the organization or just as frustrated as the personnel reporting to them. Believe me, we've had a lot of sessions with a lot of managers and they're just as frustrated as everyone else. And guess what? Our management are just as good a people as anybody and everybody else. They also fall into the 99%. The folks that run the companies also fall into the 99%. That was what I was saying is that if everyone basically, 99% are good folks, then why are we having all these issues? We're having these issues because of the, uh, number one, is the four barriers to quality and these lack of base skills internally. Okay, so that's what we're kind of looking at is in regards to the base skills. The base skills were really created through uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours and thousands of interaction with employees in regards to these issues that we were coming across in the, work, in the workplace over this last decade. 
Let's look now at page two, and it says the ABS Foundation is based on skills gained from experience and derived from uh, business practices. We were not those dudes that went into a boardroom that were in the training industry or education industry and said, hey, what do you think we could sell our people? We were the guys in the back of the room trying to figure out how to put and uh, move our organization forward and how to basically get it into a position to where the owner of the organization wasn't having to work 24 hours a day. So we really didn't have a grand plan when we started. All we knew is that we had these issues and we've had and we have to fix them and resolve them. So literally we spent the next seven years and 20,000 hours uh, developing that, moving that to a written form. For every process action, there is a people reaction affecting the whole system. This is kind of what we were talking about the other day. We go in and we implement something or talk about doing something, and most of the time it's a system, whether it's in the form of a product or a service or the processing of it, is that, or of that order request. But what we don't really take into account or the people issues internally. How are we going to train them? How are they going to accept it? Have we had input with them? Because there's nothing worse in the organization than when you get something thrown at you and we look at it and we know it makes absolutely no sense and we wonder why in the world they just didn't ask us. And what we found is that, the, again, there's no great conspiracy going on out there. It's just the four barriers to quality. So again, we have to step back and look at it, and we can't blame. And we're looking at the uh, BSG Awareness Centers, what we call it, the approach. And our goal there was the continuance and growth of organizations, students, and personnel through practical application. Not only was I kind of a, a victim of it, but a lot of our people that are out there in the workforce Number one was, is that we'd go to training and we take it back and we couldn't apply it to our job. Number two was, is that if we went to school or college or continuing education, we learned a lot of great stuff or concepts, but what we couldn't do was take it and apply it. So what we're saying here is that this ABS, this applied business science, these base skills of both people and process, really are where, what we can do and apply through application, meaning everything we've talked about up to now, gaining the awareness and understanding in that part one, part two, we're now looking at basically coming to an agreement and an understanding of the organization, the systems, the base work center concepts, getting, to, getting all this stuff down. Now looking at ourselves, this is practical application. We're saying we know exactly what it is and we know exactly where we got to apply it and how. So if you look at this, we're saying what are some of these things that we need, these eight items are the base values. Defining the ethical character and values of the organ, allowing the true character of the organization, student, personnel to surface. We have to look at the base skills, and that's kind of where we're at right now. The education and, con and training is that it has to be continuous, and it has to be specific. It has to be applied or uh, uh, applicable to our people and our process, to our organizations, and to our homes. The en enhancement, we're saying creating greater value of existing skills and training by and we'll cover this in another workshop, but gaining this, this understanding of these base skills and these four barriers to quality, what existing training we have into place, we're able to enhance it. Proactive, reactive skills. What we want to do, remember, we're saying when there's fear and all this stuff internally within an organization, we become very reactive. We're saying, okay, we need to know these reactive skills because it's not going to be a fine line that's going to draw and say that all of a sudden we are in line and have proactive skills, so we have to have these reactive skills to address these issues, especially in this transition here. So the proactive skills are, and this is what we're saying that we'll gain through awareness and understanding of the four barriers and these base skills of people in process. That when we look at doing something internally within the organization, we will have the awareness up front to be proactive, meaning that when we're looking at this deal that's set out on the table, we will know that that thing is doomed from day one. 
That's why we're saying that if there's fear in an organization, we're not going to throw that one out on the table. We're just going to let it end up with somebody else. So the proactive meaning, here's an issue. You remember the four barriers audit, the thing that we can go through and look at and say, hey, does it apply here, here? We can look at the management, planning, scheduling, and monitoring. So the proactive is, is that we're putting the deal on the table, we're able to identify and also prepare and do it up front correctly to where we're not having to do what we call reactive skills. So that's where our proactive, reactive, and preventive skills come in. People and process skills, again, that we believe that these base skills should be in every organization and every people and process skills internally within that organization and both people and process is that they have to include both. We can't run off over here and work on just process. We have to bring our people along with it. That's kind of like what's happening now with all the technology that's out there. The technology, it's like every month is moving on. Well, I guarantee you most of our people are still right here. And, and what's, what's another interesting thing, we still have problems with some people that having problems just filling out paperwork. So again, the base skills and bringing our people along with that process and leadership. We have to look at also the, value, uh, the uh, valued assets, which are basically our students and our personnel. And that I've heard that, it, well, if we ain't got customers, we're not going to have a... Who's ever selling that thing, guys? We got to have everybody in the organization on the same page going in the same direction, and we have to treat them as valued assets. And let's let, look at also, instead of where we've gotten in a lot of organizations, looking at them uh, basically as a line item expense that they're costing us money. And that's a whole nother issue and a whole nother story. Leadership, the development of leadership throughout the organization that will in turn help re retrain and model behaviors that we associate with leaders and good citizens. Because again, the leadership, and there's some stories in this one, I believe it's Ricky is the story, but what's going to happen here, you're going to see some examples that we've experienced over the years of people that did not have an opportunity until the program came in and the awareness and understanding of the organization that were able to promote and move internally, and which in effect brought their leadership skills out. So you develop leaders and leadership throughout the organization. And let's look at page number three now. What are the four barriers to quality? Now, I told you that you're going to hear this a gazillion times, and it's going to be reinforced because we're saying that everything that we're doing, whether it's people or process, we have to be thinking of the four barriers to quality because 98% of the time, it's going to be involved in whatever that we're going to be doing here. And believe me, you don't want to write it down. You don't Believe me, it's going to come back and bite you somewhere. So let's look at what are the four barriers to quality. On page three, it says, the, the, number one, the fear of expression or action, the lack of communication, verbal and or written, the lack of written procedure, and the lack of training. So if you look at that, that's what we're talking about, the four barriers to quality. And y'all remember we said we can't train till we have written procedure developed by the people doing the job. We can't get that till we have open and honest communication. We can't get that till we remove the fear of expression or action. So then we also, the foundation of that is the base values. And the, the base values and the underlying structure is built on the two rules. The two rules are do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. Now we talked about that. We've all kind of heard about those two rules. And someone was saying, well, they're just as uh, valuable in work as they are at home. And why does it get to where we act like we don't have these two rules at work? Because we've got a lot of other stuff out there influencing a lot of our decisions. And what we're in, uh, most of us now are in conflict with is what we feel right here. So doing those two rules, do what's morally and ethically correct, and treat everybody as you want to be treated, almost 99% again of every CEO, every founder of any organization, and like I said, I still haven't found an uh, owner of an organization that was just a bad person. I have yet to found, find them, not unless they had so much money that they could just go out there and do whatever they wanted and didn't need any people or any employees or nothing with them. I still ain't met that person. So if you look at it, 
those base values and those two rules are there. But because of the four barriers, we can some can t sometimes think that they're not there, but they are there. They're underlying. We just got to bring, bring them up and treat those skills to get our people aware of them. And then we have the quality issue. The quality issue is in violation of the two rules. And what we're talking about the quality issue, the quality issue can be people, process, procedure, personality. It doesn't matter. We're saying if it's a problem, it's a problem. And one of the things we've gotten a bad habit in is that our employees bring us an issue or a problem, we're saying, well, no, nah, that's not really a problem. We're going to work on it. Remember, if that employee is bringing it up and they're bringing it to you and saying it's a problem, it's a problem and we have to address it because what happens, we start making, whether we realize it or not, decisions on what are problems and what are not, frustrating the tar out of our employees. Okay, let's go now to, and let's look at uh, page number four. Page number four is kind of a little workshop, and the workshop is why do we see it that way? I'm sure there's probably a better name for it, but uh, we're trying to keep it simple here. Let's look at number one. This is something that we do internally within these organizations, and it's really kind of a thing to start putting our mind kind of in order to look at ourselves, and not only look at ourselves, but try to understand ourselves and look at why people are acting and interacting the way that they do. Let's look at number one. An event and an action affects each of us, or each of us, in, I'm sorry, an event and action affects each of us in each in a different way because we're saying here that there's no two people alike. So whatever that event or that action is, is that it's going to affect each of us different. So what you're thinking is, is we talked about it earlier, a no-brainer or common sense or who, who would get upset about that is that because no two people are alike, the two people are going to take it different. And so each individual, again, is going to take it in two different ways because no two people are alike. And we're saying that their interpretations of those events and actions are also colored or flavored by their past. And we're saying there their past experience, meaning I use as an example that I saw my daddy get all uh, beat up and abused by a car salesman that was in a, in a suit. So based off of that, when I was a kid, I get out here in the workplace and I see somebody in a suit, I immediately start thinking that I don't trust them. That's what we're talking about, is that that past experience now is fla flavoring how you're looking at the, the event or the action that's happening. So now we're saying no two people are alike, so we're influenced by our past and past experiences, and they could be at the last job as early as that. So we're saying that's why in the world that two people look at two things in two different ways, and then we all go, hey, why did they get all aggravated? because we're, not all of us are the same, and we're carrying around a lot of us of what we call our sack of rocks, these things that we're bringing with us through our childhood. The event and action does not affect us the same way every time because, okay, again what we're saying is, is that the same event or action doesn't affect us the same way every time. So example, we're having a meeting. Well, why did they get so angry because we're going to have a meeting today. We've had that meeting every day for 67 years. Now they're getting angry about it. Is that because how we uh, basically feel about it, how we feel at the time of or how our mood is. So example, other times we've had that meeting, I've taken it and moved through it, but at the time I'm not feeling good about myself, something's happened, or I'm thinking about something or something just happened, so then again, every time that deal is going to change based off how, really, how we feel about anything or that issue at that time. How we, how, we are all changed by what we see and experience. This is what we were talking about awareness, and this is what we were talking about earlier, about most of our awareness and growth stops after high school, because we are changed by what we experience and what we see. So look at it. Let's step back. So if we're coming out of high school and we go st straight into a marriage, let's say, and have kids and go straight to work, 
really, let's just say in a nutshell, other than somebody we bump into at Kmart or something, but the majority of us here, these are our two environments where we're at mostly. So we're going to be influenced by those two envir environments. So if nothing's happening new here at home, and there's nothing happening new at work, where is our growth going to come from? See, this is the key. So this is where we're saying that the base skills and the continuance of education has to, and the learning has to keep moving and has to keep going. So if that's, that's basically how we're going to grow. And this is an interesting thing. Uh, we say these, these things are, we're saying these two principles happen in others, but not in me. And we're saying, hey, we're not affected, the other people are. They're the ones that have a problem, it's not me. So we have a tendency to see these events and actions in other people, and we're saying, no, they happen just as much to us, and we need to step back and look at ourselves before we start judging or uh, putting opinions on other people. Let's look inside. So what we really talked about here is that the event, events and actions affect us each in different ways. Now, we've talked about that. No two people are alike and we're flavored by our past experience. The events and actions not affect us the same time because it depends on how we feel. And we learn through what we see and experience, and these two principles happen in others, but not in me. Let's get real. Let's look at ourselves, and let's step back and look and see and think about how we can continually improve ourselves. If you look at number three, we learn to see things through our response to life's events and actions because we learn, we learn as we go through life. That's kind of what we talked about. As we go through life, we learn. So again, if our environments are closed or in a particular uh, area, that's what's going to influence. And as we go through life, we continually learn. Well, let's have a structured learning pattern there of education and awareness and understanding instead of kind of haphazardly trying to... <laughs> you know, basically bumping into walls and then we learn, well, we need to turn the light on before we go into that dark room. We're saying here we learn as we go through life. So this is the importance of the base skills, is that we have to have these base skills and they have to be here at work. That's how we're going to learn and grow. Now, will that benef benefit your organization? You darn right it's going to benefit your organization. Our views of events and action is through our learned perception. And what we're saying there is that we kind of call it our prejudice perception. We see things basically or respond to it from how we've learned to see things. And that was based off of our prejudice perception, the way we were brought up, the neighborhood we were brought up, the company I worked at, the positive or negative influences that we had, the childhood, the friends I have, all of these, these things here or have basically an impact on how we see things. So if you look at, we are learning how to see, and I know that sounds kind of crazy, but what we're doing is that whether we realize it or not, with all these things happening around us, this is how we're going to see. And it says, where you sit is what you'll see. We're saying, put yourself in the other shoes. So we're sitting here and we're going, ah, oh, yeah, I don't know why in the world they just don't jump and board. It seems logical. Well, put yourself in their shoes. It was interesting. I'm over at one of our companies, and they were talking about I came in, and uh, they had been trying to get the air conditioner fixed, and we had some folks out there, and it was kind of hot. The guys in the plant were just burning up. So I went out there, and I go, well, are they going to get the, the air conditioner fixed? They go, well, we're kind of working on it. Man, they've had somebody out here two or three days. So I went up front. Well, guess what? Up front, it's about 68 degrees, and everybody's got sweaters on. Well, their sense of urgency is a little different than the folks that are working in it. So when we're saying we need the air conditioner fixed out, outside, out in the plant, do you think their sense of urgency is a little different? Do you think their kind of perception is a little different? Well, I don't know what they're hollering and screaming about. It's not that bad. <laughs> Go out there. Put yourself in their shoes. And that's a really good example of what we're talking about there. It's easy to sit here and point fingers. Get out there, get involved, get in that person's situation and look at it on how they're seeing it. We see events and actions not as they are, but as we are. Ooh. 
we see events and actions with the flavor of our past. This is kind of what we had just talked about here, is that if you look at it, we don't actually see what's happening as they are until our awareness grows. And so if you look at it, we're saying here is that what we're seeing happening is based off of our past. That's where we're saying we learn to see things. We learn this prejudice perception. So it depends on that particular environment or experience is how we do that. So if you think of it, not only am I learning with, I call it our prejudice perception based off of our past, but look, if you got three, four, five hundred, six thousand employees, you got six thousand different interpretations of that same issue. Another interesting thing, I just heard this the other day, that they're saying that uh, the chances in the same family of you being born, like an example of if my mom and daddy had another Bruce Snell, which I'm not sure the world's kind of ready for it, but it would be 350 billion to one. They would have to have 350 billion kids before they'd get another one of me. So I would say the chances of that's happening, not only for the sake of the world, but for mankind is, is the fact it ain't going to happen. So we're all individuals and we need to take that into consideration. A positive person sees things differently than a negative person. Ooh, this is some interesting things here because uh, y'all remember I was talking to you about when we were in a company and we're saying, hey, let's look at the positive side. We need to be up. We need well, somebody gave me a book a long time ago, and they said, and I was reading somewhere in there, and it says, in effect, what we say is that, hey, you can be positive or negative. It's totally your decision. I go, that's a bunch of bull. I, I I'm going to be who I am based off of whatever right I have to be, and that's not that easy. We're saying that you can get up in the morning and have a good day or a bad day. It's totally your decision, and I thought that was bull until I tried it, and that's where that affirmation stuff came in and the whole bit. So a negative person is going to see it different than a positive person. And we're saying it's just as easy to be positive as it is negative. But we have to subconsciously think about it. How do we start thinking about it? It has to be in word force daily. It has to be an affirmation. It has to be at the company. It has to be in our environment. Because remember, we're saying back here, our thoughts are really who we are. And you ever, you ever notice you think about some of the negative things you don't want to happen and they happen? I really believe what we put out, we get back. So if you look at that, we need to, if there's a negative thought there, we need to replace it with a positive. And it's through training, education, and awareness and understanding of why these things and how these things are happening. This is what we're talking about, that affirmation. Get rid of those bad habits. Our view of life stays the same, uh, kind of the same, because we have and are formed our habit patterns. Really kind of interesting. I really believe that most of us are kind of who we are in, in a sense at around eight or ten years old or something. And I know there's some folks out there that are screaming that's probably been to uh, psychology school or something that have it. But I think basically that's why it's so important with our kids to give them unconditional love is that that love gives in effect security that they can trust their mom and daddy in fact builds their own security and we're saying here is that we kind of develop those patterns and we kind of stay the same because they have formed and become habit and habit patterns so we're looking at from the time we're this this big out into the workplace we kind of have formed our habit patterns and that's why we're saying is that that bully in the schoolyard ends up going into the workplace we didn't deal with him at the schoolyard, so now we're having to deal with him in the workplace. This is why the awareness and the understanding has to come in. New events and actions, same habits. Again, we're saying, I'm sorry, no new events or actions, the same habits. So we're saying if our awareness and our understanding is not going to grow because we're still in the same group, the same people, the same events and actions, the same job, the same home, we're not getting any external uh, different education or awareness. So in effect, we're going to stay the same without having input or without having 
extra awareness or education and training. So if, if our no new events, we stay the same. This is why we're saying we have to do these base skills internally within the organization. We have to do these base skills to help our people grow. If their people are growing, they're also going to help our organization. That in turn help themselves. Our perception is what we see, what we're looking for, because wishful thinking to avoid conflict, internal and external. We're saying here the perception, we're going to see what we want to see. And I've seen this a lot of times with uh, a lot of us as parents. We're seeing our kids doing everything wrong or that kind of think that we believe that they might have, let's say, a drug, drug problem. What we're going to do is that we're going to see that how we want to see it. We're going to see it as the fact that they do not have a drug problem. Even though all the evidence is there, we're going to see, we're going to have wishful thinking. We're going to see that, oh, well, they're just doing that because they're tired. They can't get up. Oh, we're just, they're just doing that because they're kind of jittery and they're all excited and they're kind of moving around real fast and they're kind of getting negative and their friends are all changing. Well, they're changing because they're changing or they change. We, we see wishful thinking. This is where we're talking about the awareness of stepping back and looking at and dealing with the true issues. Our prejudiced perception of past events and actions are learned habits. So again, we're seeing back with our prejudiced perceptions of events and actions. Again, is that why all of us look at things different? And we have to have the understanding and the aware awareness that we're seeing it one way. Chances are everybody else around the table is seeing it a different way. Fear narrows our perceptions of events and actions. It's safe. What we're saying there is that when there's fear and we're feel fearful and we're insecure, is that our perception just comes in here. And we become very like this for the fact we don't want to see anything else out there. Because if we see anything out there, that's scary to us. And that's not safe. So we want to just keep looking here. You know, somebody beat me on the head with a hammer. <laughs> And I'm going, okay, well, I don't really want to see who's doing that. I just keep kind of walking forward, and they keep hitting me in the head with a hammer. So if you look at it, we just keep focused and looking straight ahead. So when, when there's fear, we don't look at everything outside of here. We get very tunnel vision, the same way an organization does. It's no different. When there's fear, we get zoned in right here, and we're not paying attention to things out there. And a lot of times, the things that are happening around us are telling us what we need to be doing. But if there's fear, we're not paying them no attention. And not only that, but if you look at it, is that when we're focused in here and there's fear, is that chances are, whatever those issues are, they'll continually follow us from here on out. And that's why we're saying is that the, uh, the insecure person at work the 1% that's just wreaking havoc on us, their whole vision's right here. It's not truth. It's not just. It's not what's fair. It's not goodness. It's not kindness. It's not anything other than because of their insecurities, they're scoped into just exactly what they want at, and their benefit at the expense of everyone else. That's the problem with that 1% and the insecurities and not having this education and this continuous awareness. Our subconscious will complete those events and actions which are incomplete. What we're talking about there is that our mind it can't accept a half sentence. They'll complete it. And so what we're saying there is that whatever we happen to be looking at is that if it's incomplete or we don't understand it, the mind refuses to see that and we'll fill in the blanks. That's another reason what we're talking about written uh, procedure and written communication because we hear and if it's not exactly what we understand, we're going to fill in the blanks of what we think to complete the sentence and we'll do it. That's where we talk about. We come back in with the deal and they're going, hey, where are you coming from? What were you doing, shooters when I told you that? What we're saying here is that with this back here, we're going to complete whatever that thing that we don't know. And Remember, with all these sack of rocks we got, this is depending on how we're going to do that. We complete the events in action and accept it as factual. This is what we're saying here, that when we get into a problem internally within an organization, 
and we're starting to address conflict, that's why we're saying we'll defend and justify. Even though we know that that guy is so far wrong in their eyes and in their heart and whether they want, they make themselves to believe it, they believe it is fact because to them it is fact. So when we're dealing with that 1% and that negative uh, person is that they literally get into that point because of their narrow focus in the organization and in life is that everything they see is factual and everything that they see is that everybody out there is against them. They're world beaters. So what happens is the world's against them, the world's their cause of misery other than looking at ourselves and say, hey, you ever think maybe it's me? No, they won't. It's everybody else until you gain that awareness or understanding. Our own thoughts and facts depend on our position. <laughs> now that's an interesting one. Depends on, also, let's just take it where we're at in the organization. If we look at that particular thing, depends on where we're at, is that really, that's, that's how we perceive it. So if you look at it, our own thoughts and facts defend our position. So if we're getting these incorrect half sentences, half information, the 1% here are feeding us up with it, is that we're going to sit here and plug it into our mind, complete those sentences, and we're going to have an opinion basically helped formed by somebody else or by our past. That's why we say that we have to deal with data and we have to focus in on the four barriers to quality. And let's look on page five. It says we simplify events and in in actions that we don't understand because the reason we simplify things is, is that we want to save face. Have you ever been in a meeting and we're all like shaking our head and they're talking about something and we have no idea what they're talking about? And then all of a sudden nobody says anything and we all walk out the door? Well, the reason, again, is our insecurities and the thing that we're dealing with. Do you think fear is affected by that? Yes, it is. So if you look at it, we won't admit we don't know. So we'll just kind of simplify it to make sure we undernote. That's where the miscommunication comes in. Why it has to be written, has to be communicated in written form, the written procedure, we have to define it. See, it starts going over and over again. Remember, we structure what we see and understand. So whatever we're seeing based off of whatever these issues we have personally in our past, present life is, is that what we're saying, that's the way we're going to see it to understand it. So somebody from Alabama converse to somebody in the Bronx are probably going to see the same thing in a little different tent based off of their environment. So again, let's step back and look what we've talked about here is that you've got the 1,200 people in your organization looking at the same issue. Let's just say it's that lamp. We're all going to see different things in that lamp, and that's going to bring up different experiences and thoughts. So in effect, I'm looking at it and say that's just a lamp on a table. Someone's going to be looking at it. They got burnt by a lamp when they was a kid going, hey, boy, I bet if you touch that lamp, it'd be hot. So if you look at that, we got 1,200 people looking at that situation in a whole different manner based off of their past experiences. So we wonder why there's miscommunication and misunderstanding and bad relationships both at work and at home. Think about that. That's why as an organization, if we get these base skills, it helps the awareness and understanding of our people. Let's look at our self-image determines how we will see events and actions. And this is exactly what we're talking about. I'm going to look at positive versus negative. Uh, we look at things in a, in a positive attitude, it's good. Negative, it's bad. Positive, not a problem, a problem. A winner, a loser. Fun and happy and hateful. See, this is what we're talking about. Same event, same action, depending if we're positive or negative, how we're going to see it. And you know that. They go, oh, I just got a big sack of money. Oh, what a bummer. It's not the bills that I want. I'm going to have to go down to the store and change them in to get 20s. I don't like dealing with hundreds. I know a lot of us got that problem. How we perceive the events and actions of others is determined by our image of that person because we view the events and actions not as their merit, but how we feel about that person. And that's what we're saying. We must remove our emotions and, and deal with data. We have a tendency to look at people just because something that they've done, and it might be 
uh, warrant it. But what happens, we start building that prejudice perception with that person. We really need to step away, pull our emotions out of the deal, and look at the data. Why is that event? Let's look at that lamp, not the reason that the lamp's thrown off of the desk, but look at the lamp, not look at that person and say they threw that lamp off of there because they're just a bad person. We need to be asking why. So again, uh, let's look at and move, remove the emotion from the deal and deal with data. We all have a level of prejudice perception based on our environment, attitude and or past, present of events and actions. How we feel about ourselves, our emotional reaction to others and other people, events and actions are all for barriers to our objective perception. So any one time, how we feel about ourselves is how we see other people. And we, gain, we only gain new perception through new experiences. The improvement comes through new knowledge, attitude, and values that must be reinforced daily. Change will not, unhap will not happen until we're aware of that that change is needed. That's where the awareness comes in. That's where the base skills come in. That's where all this stuff that we're talking about comes in. And I've had some personal, a lot of personal experience on this. So that's what we're talking about there is, is really looking at why we see things different. And we really want to look at, number one, is why someone else sees it different than we see it. Not that they're bad people, but it's based off of their experiences and their past and their awareness and their understanding and all these other things. And the fact is that there's nobody else like us. And I know some of you are sad to see that not everybody's like you, but the majority of us aren't. Let's look at uh, page six. This is a story about Ricky. And I'll read the life lesson. Some of the brightest talent in your organization have not yet turned on their lights. Ricky was one in one of our companies that was a receptionist and kind of had been there for four or five years, a divorced mom with two kids. We got into the program and there were some issues and she started bringing them up and she started forming task teams. Before you know it, she was involved in these issues of really solving some major problems internally within that organization. And it just happened to be with the order and request process. So what happened was, as Mickey got the, uh, the awareness, the understanding, and those base skills, she just shot up through the organization. So if you look at it, a lot of our talent is there. And there's another story out there that we have in the book. It says that extraordinary uh, employee you seek is probably already in your employment. That person you're looking for, we have to give them the skills and, and basically the chance and the support, the responsibility, and the trust to be them their, their best. If you look at page seven, we all want to belong. Uh, and the life lesson there is wanting to belong is not an option, it's a need. It's really interesting here is that if you look at we want to all belong, we all want to belong to something, and most of us don't belong to a country club. We either have the work or we have home. And this was an, a, a true story here, and a lot of this stuff is about kind of issues I went through. Uh, when I was in school, uh, I didn't feel like I belonged, and it was in junior high because I was always fighting and about getting thrown out all the time until I, they made me start participating in sports. And then all of a sudden, when I started participating in sports, I started feeling like I belonged to school. So if you look at it by getting your people involved in the organization, they will start feeling like they belong, and they want to belong to something. And most of us have only our work, and we have, uh, I'm sorry, our families and our work. So then again, we have to make these good work environments as well as that will in turn help our home life. So if you look at it, we all want to belong to something. That's why we have gangs out there. To us, it seems illogical. To a gang member, that's the only place that they belong. If you look at the universities of tomorrow, that's page eight, our organizations will become the university tomorrow with the employees being the students. The base skills must include both people and process. This is all what we're talking about. The University of Tomorrow are going to be in our organizations, and they're going to be working with base skills with our employees. So that's what that whole story is about. And we're saying charity begins at home. Let's give to our people. Let's help our people that will in turn help our organization that will in turn help our families and our communities. Let's look at now page number nine. It says gangbanger. That story there 
is of how we can easily program our children. There was an incident at one of these companies. I read the life lessons. Uh, we are as programmable as a computer, and we are who we perceive ourselves to be. It was interesting. At this, they had the little kid dressed up like a gangbanger, looked like a gangbanger, had the hat on, the baggy things, and all that. And it was already living in kind of an environment. What do you think that kid's going to grow up to be? How are people going to perceive them? And if you look at it, we are who we perceive ourselves to be and how others see us. In fact, we become that internally. And there's a lot of... Uh, it's really interesting. They did a uh, study that they put people in, gave them three were guards and three were prisoners, and they said without telling them anything, they all acted out the roles. And that's what we're doing here, and we have to be very conscious of that because we will act out those roles. Look at working through negative rap. That's on page 10. Let's become aware of how we communicate with one another and focus on the positive side of life. It's just as easy to have a good day as a bad day. It's your decision. It's your programming. So let's work through the negative rap. Instead of communicating negatively, let's communicate positively. Let's get out of that habit of throwing in that little jab whenever we can. Number 11 is take it as a win. Page 11, it says, take daily accounts of your wins and discards the negative. We have a tendency to discard our wins and focus on the negative. That creates worry. That creates stress. We end up discarding our wins and just focusing on the negatives. Take account of your wins. When somebody says something, just go, hey, I'm taking it as a win. Even though it might be a little, pos uh, little negative, so take it as a win. Discount those negatives. Now, let's go to page uh, uh, 12 here. We're looking at frequently asked questions. What are base skills of people in process? Base skills are things that we learn internally within the organization to help us both at work and at home. How are these skills transferable? These transferable skills are both of people in process. We learn them. We can apply them anywhere in the organization and also anywhere in our life. After high school, learning stops for most of us. That's exactly right. What we need to do is have continuation of learning. What is an affirmation? An affirmation is repeating something uh, two to three times a day for eight or nine months for it to become a changed habit. That's what an affirmation, that's why we have to positively, continuously reinforce the positive. What does ABS mean? Applied business science. Taking what we've learned and being able to apply it to business. What is a proactive, reactive skill? A proactive is being able to prevent something from happening. Reactive is having the skills to fix it. We call what is a preventive skill? A preventive skill is kind of what we're doing here is to keep something from happening, kind of like that proactive. Describe continuance and growth. In order to have continuance and growth, what we have to do is that we have to build these base skills. For every process action, there's people. For everything that happens in a process, it'll affect our people. How do we continue to grow personally and professionally? By developing these base skills and this learning and this awareness. If you look at what we've talked about here today on these base skills is really the foundation of awareness and understanding. So we want you to think about all these other things that we've talked about and gone over here today and look at how from one class to the other that we're building on them and next uh, next part uh, of the ABS program, we're going to really get into some hard structure and process stuff, but we've really laid a good foundation. I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys at our next class. Uh, thank you and have a good day.